Listen only mode. Good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Garlington, and welcome to the view of the 7180. Hopefully, everyone can see the see the slides here. Uh, this is the webinar to introduce the AP7181, the 802.11n outdoor product. As I said, my name is Scott Collington. I'm the product manager of the Mesh Network Product Group. I'll be going over some of the market drivers and the technology uh, that we've designed the 7181 around. Bill Rabino is going to go over the supporting portfolio of the 802.11n uh, products. And Rosalie Babona is the product manager, and she'll be going over some of the details and specifications of the 7181. We also have Matt Ward with us, who is a product management on our team. And he's going to be trying to answer your questions as you submit them online uh, in real time. He'll, we'll also gather up some of the more common questions and answer them at the end of the seminar. So there's a couple of ways you can submit those. One is to, uh, in the chat mode, you can chat to staff, and we'll see them. Or if you have a questions bar on the uh, webinar, uh, that you see there, you can also submit them through the questions. So feel free to submit questions. If we don't get a, a live answer to you, a uh, summary answer at the end, we'll make sure we'll get, it, we'll get the answer to you um, via email. Okay. Um, before I get started into it, I, I did want to, for those that aren't familiar with the Mesh Network product group, uh, the team has been developing outdoor Wi-Fi products since 2000. Uh, we support some of the largest and oldest networks deployed, like Providence, Rhode Island, Plano, Texas, and Cocoa Beach, which, which was actually the very first citywide Wi-Fi deployment. Uh, the engineering team has uh, developed over 140 patents in the outdoor mesh space and has somewhere around 450 pending patents. So we've been at this quite a bit. That's what our focus is. It's what we do. Oops. I'm sorry. Let's uh, go back one more. OK, so um, as the screen's updated here, uh, let's take a look at the market trends. Um, today we are seeing real awkward trend in outdoor Wi-Fi deployment. Here are just a few of the recent articles that validate the the interest and what we are seeing in the market. Video surveillance and the demand for higher bandwidth, mobility for public safety and transportation, multi-use city-wide deployments that support many city departments. All these drive uh, justification with real ROI. And everyone is looking to see what .11n will provide. Applications is what drives the payback of these networks. As you can see in video surveillance, there's a number of applications around that, from fixed cameras to red light cameras, public transit surveillance, where we have cameras on buses and trains these days, uh, workforce mobility, police officers, uh, utility vehicles, all need mobile offices. And a big uptake, what we're seeing is uh, command and control or monitoring control with meter reading, smart parking. Um, a good example of this is that has been recently deployed is a city here in Florida, uh, Hollywood. Uh, it's a 29 square mile city that uh, has deployed about 400 APs at this point. The total will be around 700 APs. The total cost of the project was $13 million. Uh, about two million of that was for the, the access point. So the the access points not only drive services, backhaul equipment, and everything, it, but there is a uh, substantial uptake when when these networks go in to drive additional uh, revenue uh, for the services and the products. Of the product uh, they expect to have payback on this uh, within, I believe, two and a half years. And the, initial, the total savings that they'll have uh, from the services and 
and capabilities that they're deploying is $23 million over a 15-year period. So those are some of the drivers that we're seeing, uh, so quite substantial, uh, all around local, high bandwidth broadband, broadband network. But let's look at what .11n standard is doing. Uh, if you haven't heard, it's uh, been ratified this month. It was expected to be ratified January 2010, but it's been ratified around uh, the draft two uh, revision. Uh, so all the products, most of the products out there today are draft two compliant. Uh, the Wi-Fi Alliance has already certified over 450 draft two products, and Intel has shipped 3 million .11n clients. So .11n is already prevalent in public safety, education, healthcare, manufacturing, and professional services. The overall growth of the uh, .11n market in the outdoor space and, and from a Y5 perspective, as you can see that the graph, the yellow graph shows the trend in Wi-Fi devices shipping .11n uh, products by 2012, over 90% of all Wi-Fi products will use .11n. The green graph shows an upward growth of the outdoor meshing networks. Delore is the only analyst that, that has tracked this specific market. And as you can see, it's had a, a little bit of a downturn over the uh, last couple of years that was due to some of the uh, uh, Muni Wi-Fi uh, failures, which really focused around providing free access. Uh, that wasn't a model that worked, and that's why uh, we just went through what the cities are seeing a model that works is true ROI uh, or a real payback where they can uh, justify the networks. And the interesting thing here is that uh, Delaware sees almost a 40% growth in 2010. So we think we have the right product at the right time. Some of the key technologies that we want to talk about, uh, just to make you aware, what does .11n bring to the table? Uh, MIMO, I think everybody's heard about that. It's the ability to transmit and receive multiple in, multiple out. Facial multiplexing is, is a key. It, it allows for dual data streams or multiple data streams. Packet aggregation, where it uh, reduces the amount of headers on the packets and increases the payload across the channel. And channel bonding, being able to um, take advantage of the full 40 megahertz. A lot of these features and technologies, as .11n is, is designed around an indoor network. Uh, having the ability to use 40 megahertz in an outdoor space is going to be difficult. Uh, a number of things change quite a bit in the outdoor environment. So. When you talk about dot 11n, it's not just MIMO that that takes that brings the advantage, especially in the outdoor environment. You need MIMO, you need spatial multiplexing, a good packet aggregation algorithm, and channel bonding. So you need them all. One of the key things, as I talked about, is MIMO and spatial multiplexing. You'll see terminology like 3x3x2. Three by three by this refers to number of transmit antennas, number of receives, and number of data paths. Uh, the 3 relates to the multiple transmits, which is uh, CSD. Uh, and this requires uh, to take full advantage of this, both the uh, transmit and receive to, to have multiple receive antennas to maximize the delivery of free transmission. On the receive side, it's referred to as MRC, or maximum ratio combining. Uh, this is increased receive sensitivity, which is uh, the more powerful of the two, where it, if you can receive uh, the signals on, on all three channels, even a, even a device uh, transmitting with a single stream will be heard better. So this works with both MIMO and non-MIMO clients, which improves even BG type clients connecting to the network. And finally, the uh, spatial multiplexing, which is the ability to transmit 
dual data streams uh, simultaneously uh, uh, transmitting the different streams at the same time, uh, which can have the effect of doubling your data rate. It, here is an example of uh, 40 megahertz channels, the type of data rate that you can get to on a single stream uh, with .11 and is uh, 157 megabits, where a dual stream is double that at 300 megabits per second. So in order to get to the pure 300 uh, megabits per second, you really need all three of them. Let's, uh, I'm just going to take some time here to introduce you to the 7181. Uh, this is a, a picture of it uh, mounted here in, uh, Fort, in Lake Mary. Um, the AP71 uh, uses 3 by 3 by 2 MIMO to utilize all of the DOT 11N capabilities. Each radio delivers a full watt of RF power. The ADAPT antenna is custom designed to deliver the highest performing Omni coverage on all radios. Mesh Connects is the best in class routing algorithm and provides network stability. It is also supported by one point wireless suite for network planning and management. And when deployed with the 7131 provides true indoor outdoor networking. We will talk a little bit more or, or more in depth on the product specifications towards the end of the webinar. So from a go-to-market point of view, there's three things we want you to remember. Zero, 300, and one. Zero stick antennas for not only the best antenna uh, coverage, but also for best uh, aesthetics. Uh, Remember, if you have an equivalent product with uh, two radios running three by three, you have six antenna sticks coming out of that box, which is pretty difficult to deploy anywhere. 300, uh, the AP71 provides more system capacity at a 300 megabit in the mesh layer. We'll talk a little bit more why this is, this is key and unlike any of our competitors. And one, one complete indoor outdoor solution, one network management solution, and one company, Motorola, that brings them all. So let's talk a little bit about the ADEPT antenna system. Uh, this is a unique antenna system that has been de designed specifically for the 7181. It's a custom, only available from Motorola. It provides dual screens uh, support by providing dual polarized antennas. DOT-11N standard is based on indoor environment. It counts on reflections and multipath to achieve high data rates and take advantage of dual screens being transmitted. In the outdoor environment, there are limited reflections and extreme multipath delay. Therefore, the AP must deli deliberately inject the diversity by using horizontal and vertical polarized antennas. The AP7181 provides both horizontal and vertical polarization on each panel, but each radio. Self-shadowing avoidance. The, as I mentioned, a traditional sticky antenna will, uh, AP will have uh, six to nine possibly of a first three radio antennas uh, closely correlated next to each other, this, this creates um, extreme gain and shadowing of the, end, of the co-located antennas. This, in fact, uh, creates a very unpredictable coverage path. Using the ADEPT antenna system, we provide a symmetrical, uninterfered uh, antenna pattern, fully omni. And software electric down tilt is a capability where normally you would uh, is a deployment tool uh, that is used when you want to get better coverage down towards the ground and be able to get more client coverage or avoid co-location of APs interfering with each other in the 2-4 band. We provide that as an electronic uh, down tilt that can be controlled through the, through, through the GUI or the network management system. So it can be 
and all, all the deployments can be the same, and then the deployments, the network can be fine-tuned after it's deployed. So that's a, a quick summary of our adept antenna capability. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the 300. Why is it important to have 300 megabit capability on the mesh backhaul? Uh, as, first of all, uh, it does a number of things. As we talked about, the more applications you need, the more clients, the more, more users you have on the network, the more demand you have on the backhaul of the mesh layer. Having high capacity on the mesh layer provides quicker, quicker growth, I mean, quicker ROI or return on investment, and avoids uh, outgrowing the network or future-proofs the network capacity for the long term. The AP71 does this by offering a true 3x3 implementation on both the 2.4 and the 5.8 radio. This allows us to get to the dual data streams. The horizontal vertical polarization allows us to take advantage and use the dual data streams in the outdoor environment. Our full powered radios allows the nodes to be separated and still maintain a strong link between connectivity so you can ensure that it has maximum data rate. And on top of that, we use a, a couple of uh, Motorola specific uh, tools uh, or features. Uh, one is to optimize the rate control, and the other one is called Mesh Connect, which optimizes the, the routing algorithm. And we'll talk a little bit more about each of these. And then the, the one. Um, one company uh, bringing together one network, making it all look seamless. Uh, one, one point wireless suite provides planning, deployment, and management, air defense security, and, and along with Motorola's uh, bars and partners and service organization provide complete service and support. So we have what we feel is the ideal outdoor access point. We feel we have a best in class indoor access point. When you combine those for a seamless indoor outdoor solution and you bring together the, the backhaul of point to point, multi point, uh, best in class hand, handheld mobile computers, voice headsets, the applications, the appliances, the servers, all tested as one solution and brought to you from one company. The next slide is going to take a look at some of the performance gains that you'll see when using Dot 11 n First of all, let's look at the client side. Here's a, some test results that we did. And you, as you can see, and, and what we did here was at the AP location, we first tested with standard-based clients, the 11G, and we, we tested that against a uh, traditional DG access point in, in the 2.4 um, range. What we saw, then we replaced that same access point at the same locations with the AP7181. As you can see, significant differences. Uh, at location two, where it was almost, it was greater than 0.5 miles, we had almost four to five times uh, the, the data rate going from 0.5 megabits. You know, BG networks, an AP client's going to add significant improvements. This is going to not only uh, drive more throughput, but it increases the range, so you'll have more clients all ac accessing the single access point which in turn, again, drives uh, more demand on the backhaul. So this only works um, if you have um, a backhaul system uh, in the meshing in the mesh that is capable of supporting the additional client and throughputs. So what we show here is a kind of a heat map of planning tool um, from Broadband Planner um, that would indicate uh, two de deployments uh, being planned, one with the capabilities of BG and then one with the range and power of the 7181. As you can see, there is significantly fewer nodes and also higher amount of red and yellow in, in the uh, graph to show that it's the AP71 uh, has fewer nodes and fewer 
uh, but more more throughput coverage. To simplify this you know, view, uh, it really ended up being about a two to one ratio in that design, uh, giving you know the 7181 a significant fewer cost, fewer fewer nodes. This not only uh, reduces the number of, of nodes, but uh, reduces the total cost of ownership. Although the 7181 will be a bit more expensive than the traditional DG node, uh, you also have to take into consideration the installation cost, the maintenance cost, and the backhaul. So uh, a dot .11N network, we expect to be a, a, a lower total cost of ownership uh, than traditional DG networks. So the AP71 does this, and, and one of our key advantages in, in the marketplace is we focus on the backhaul and being able to deliver a 300 megabit dual stream and take advantage of being able to have higher data rates and greater distances between the nodes. What we've seen is on many of the competitors, they offer a MIMO 3 by one or one by three to the on the two four side, but only a single stick antenna or a traditional you know one stream on the backhaul. I think they've missed the point. Um, as you can see, with just a single stream, as we talked about, um, even in 40 megahertz, which is going to be tough to utilize it in the outdoor environment without uh, uh, MIMO. Uh, they'll gain 100, 157 megabits theoretical uh, first rate. But by using dual streams and the vertical horizontal polarization uh, to get true diversity, we can hit the 300 megabit first rate from data rates. As I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the other key advantages with the 7181 is that it makes use of mesh connects. Out of that 140 um, patterns that, are, that we've developed are all, all around mesh connects. It uses a, a, a hybrid um, routing capability where it takes the best of both proactive, which is uh, always knowing uh, the best route to use, and reactive, um, where it only maintains the neighbor list. Uh, the hybrid solution, therefore, always knows the best all, all of its neighbors and on a per packet basis uh, can determine the best route. So it's very proactive uh, from knowing all its neighbors and very reactive because it looks at every packet and determines uh, the best route. It looks at a number of uh, things within the route. Most routing engines will only look at RSSI. Uh, Mesh Connect looks at RSSI, packet loss number of pops, uh, amount of congestion on each link, and again, on a per packet basis, we'll determine that route. So in the end, it has a very fast convergence to the best route. Many, many outdoor um, APs will, will have some significant slowly converge to your route if something happens in the network. Uh, the, the real difference between indoor and outdoor is that the outdoor networks uh, have a lot of variation in them. There's, it's not a controlled environment. There's changes happening all the time from reflections off of trucks going by to uh, wind blowing trees in the way to rain. So it's a constant varying uh, environment. Mesh connects along with Orla, which is our rate adaption um, algorithm, uh, are used to maintain at the highest possible data rates and stability in the network. What this chart shows on the bottom here, uh, the red line, is your normal chipset will basically uh, determine the data rate. It will always start up and, and try to give you the highest data rate. When it starts getting collisions uh, in the network, it, it rapidly drops down, but is very slow to come back up to the higher data rates. And then when it gets more collision, it rapidly drops down. So the overall normalized uh, data rate selection that you have uh, just up, uh, off the chipset is, is what that graph shows. With Orla, it, as soon as it drops down, it, it uh, aggressively tests 
the higher data rate so to see that it can get back up to a, a more maintainable high data rate. And therefore, it will constantly give you a higher data rate selection. Um, those, therefore, between Euler and Mesh Connect, they're, they're on top of the dot 11 n capabilities, give you the best in class access point. So I'm going to turn it over to Bill Rabino now, who's going to talk a little bit about the portfolio of access points and uh, how we manage those and, and have seamless connectivity indoor outdoor. Bill? Thank you, Scott, and good morning, everyone. Um, what, we're, what you're seeing on this chart is our uh, comprehensive portfolio of access points that serve both the indoor and the outdoor markets. Um, Motorola's uh, solution uh, for, for this is we design these for wireless networks regardless of the size of the business. Uh, we've, we've deployed large outdoor municipalities that we deployed all over the world, all the way down to branch offices and small businesses, uh, delivering standard wireless coverage to virtually all types of networks, both indoor and outdoor. Motorola's innovative wireless portfolio includes standard-based 8211 a, B, and G, and now the new ratified R11N uh, standard for enterprise wireless LANs for indoor networks, all the way up to outdoor wireless mesh access points, such as the MWAN 4300 and what we're talking about today, the AP7181. In the next few slides, we'll discuss how the AP7181 is compatible with the outdoor MWAN 4300 and the wireless LAN AP7131. So for those of you who are not familiar with the MWAN 4300, this is part of our outdoor wireless mesh portfolio. This is a dual radio access point that supports 802.11 A, B, and G and features uh, standard QoS for traffic prioritization as well as Motorola's patented Mesh Connects advanced routing protocol that Scott had, had just discussed. The MWAN 4300 is designed for large-scale outdoor networks that require 802.11 A, B, and G connectivity and coverage. In addition to that, we have the MWAN VMM, which is our vehicle-mounted modem. Uh, this provides extended wireless coverage to vehicles and trains in metro rail systems. In terms of the compatibility of the AP7131 and the MWAN 4300, Motorola offers this compatibility between both of these. Uh, this will allow an outdoor network to deploy a, a mixture of AP7181s and 4300s. With this mixture, this will enable .11 AB and G clients to roam between the 4300s and the 7181s, with the .11 N clients connecting to the 7181. For mobility requirements, the, the BMM, the Vehicle Mounted Motor, will provide connectivity to, to vehicles that are moving up to 75 miles an hour or, or metro rail systems that are within the coverage area of this mixed, net, mixed network. The VMM is also uh, compatible in an all 4300, an all MWAN 4300 network, or you can also use it in an all uh, AP7181 network. Lastly, this can all be managed through our common management platform, Wireless Manager. So let's talk a little bit about the indoor products for .11n. This is the AP7131, which is a tri-radio .11n based access point. The AP7131 is designed for indoor networks providing standard .11a, b, and g, and now the new newly ratified .11n wireless standard. Uh, it provides wireless coverage for enterprise networks. The AP7131 complements the AP7181 by providing indoor coverage with the AP7181 extending that coverage to the outdoors. On this slide here, this is a, uh, this is a typical use case that demonstrates the indoor to outdoor wireless connectivity. In this example, on the left hand side, you have a warehouse that has deployed AP7131s indoors for connectivity to the .11n clients. They want to extend this coverage to the outdoors, the parking lots, which you'll see here on the right. By deploying the 7181s outdoors and connecting the network uh, uh, indoors to outdoors, you now can extend the .11n coverage indoor to outdoor. 
by specifically designing the network to have common elements such as the same IP subnet, the same SSID, and the same security parameters, a client can now seamlessly move indoor to outdoor and vice versa. So with this solution, the combination of the 7131 and the 7181 in the outdoor environment, you now really have a powerful solution to actually extend that coverage indoor to outdoor. In terms of the management of this, One Point Wireless Manager allows for the, con for the configuration and in, in the inventory management of the outdoor AT7181 networks. Wireless Manager in, in real time will display network statistics, alerts, and alarms for the network. The network elements, such as the 7181, can be dynamically displayed by the embedded Google Maps feature and include estimated coverage areas for the outdoors. In addition, the, A the indoor AP7131 deployments are also visible via the Google Mapping feature in Wireless Manager and are summarized in the network map and the wireless LAN nodes can also be configured through the click-through configuration feature that we have embedded in One Point Wireless Manager. In terms of the indoor to outdoor management, the RF management suite can be used. For customers and partners who, are tip who have typically deployed indoor networks, the RF management suite, RF RFMS, will have the capabilities to manage and configure the 7181 as well as the indoor access points such as the 7131. This will allow you to create a seamless management suite. RS management suite allows for the network planning and management of deployed, of deployed networks for the indoor wireless land APs. Custom reports can also be generated and visual, visualization channel and heat mark maps are also available as well. So I'm going to turn, turn this over to Rosalie Babona, who is the product manager for the 7181, and she's going to discuss some of the specifics about the 7181 access point. Ro? Thank you, Bill. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, first, I'd like to just cover a few of the highlights for the 7181. You heard a lot about it uh, so far from Scott and Bill, but I'd just like to touch on some of the uh, hardware aspects. It's uh, 802.11 uh, ABGN radio. Uh, two, it's a dual radio configuration, so it's a 3x3 uh, MIMO on the 2.4 and a 3x3 MIMO on the 5.X, I call it, basically because that is configurable based on country code. Um, we're rated for a harsh environment. So it's an IP67 rating with a NEMA 4 enclosure. Uh, we talked a lot about the in-depth panel antenna system for outdoor environments. That's the advanced element panel technology where we're doing true dual diversity uh, polarization to get to that second data stream, which is key in an outdoor environment. Um, we basically have two 1 gig Ethernet ports that can be configured, for example, on the wire or if you want to plug multiple cameras in. We have an integrated PoE 802.11.3AF out, which you typically want to put uh, power over Ethernet cameras on there. 20 and 40 megahertz channels, uh, that's a given on the N standard. Um, we also meet the current European DFS standards for 5.4 and 5.8. So just some highlights of the software features and the security features and the management tools. We have 16 wireless LANs. Uh, a key technology feature is the multi-radio meshing on the AP. So we can actually create meshes on the 2.4 radio and the 5X radio and go between them, which is a little different than a duo. In our duo node, we had them on the separate radios. Now you can mesh across radios and have multiple meshes on the radio. So we have four BSSIDs and on-demand channel scan and auto channel select to help with interference. We have 802.11e QoS, common, and that's eight Qs, commonly known if you did the Wi-Fi certification as uh, WMM. We have a full-featured uh, graphical user interface. So if you're familiar with the 7131 indoor, we basically ported that code to the 7181 and added all the enhanced features that we needed for outdoor, like high-powered radios, uh, mesh connects, and other features like a software electronic down tilt on the antenna system, which we found is very important for outdoor deployments because you don't determine that until you're actually at deployment. So some security features. Uh, basically, we have WPA2 and PSK, all the standard features in Wi-Fi. Uh, encryption. We do AES encryption in the hardware. 
And something that's very key is the intermesh encryption on the backhaul. We call that secure mesh uh, with AES encryption. The authentication is 802.11.1x, and that's infrastructure client uh, authentication, which is key in the Wi-Fi uh, security world. Management tools, uh, one point uh, wireless manager. We can do device discovery, uh, inventory management, uh, alarm and event management. The Google Maps feature is an important feature for outdoor environment. We can also do a click through uh, to RFMS that Bill mentioned earlier about the indoor outdoor story. We can do over the air upgrades, especially in very large outdoor networks. You want to be able to do that. And a typical um, element management system for FCAP, the full configuration, administration, and performance and security. Let's talk a little bit about the product SKUs. Um, we have five SKUs set up, and that's basically. Uh, we made them regional SKUs. You'll see that the first two SKUs, the HK1860A and the 1860A1A, are North American SKUs, an AC and a DC unit. The DC unit is a 48 volt uh, DC. The difference between the North American SKUs and the international SKUs is we're node locking the 5.4 radio on the North American SKUs. And they also have uh, power cords for the US. And all the power cords are flying lead. The uh, HK1873A is an a international SKU. It has a special power cable for EMEA in Australia for flying leads. And we have two other international SKUs set up um, for AC and DC also, and they have international power cords. What is in a 7181 product SKU? Um, think of it as everything you need um, to take that uh, device outdoors. The adaptive panels come pre-assembled. If you look to the right, you'll see a picture of the actual 7181. All four panels come pre-assembled on the unit. If you look at the very top, there's a mounting yoke. That yoke will let you, um, that's actually mounted on top. You can actually disconnect it and mount it from the bottom, depending on uh, what your deployment scenario is. Uh, sun shield is more of a decorative feature. You'll see on the very top of that box, you'll see the decorative sun shield. You can also take that sun shield, and there's a uh, the same sun shell apply to the bottom if you want to cover up the cables and then snake the cables through the mounting bracket. Uh, waterproof Ethernet adapter. Um, the one comes in the kit if you want multiples. If you're going to plug multiple cameras in, I would order an extra one. Regional power cords with flying leads because we know that outdoors everybody wants to plug into grids. There's optional uh, ordering features in the catalog for plugs and things if you need other accessories. Some high-level breakdowns of uh, the accessory pricing. I, I lump them into deployment accessories because you have to determine where you want to hang this. You want to put it on a pole, a roof, or against a building. Determine, depending on how you want to mount it, you would order one of these typical uh, mounting pieces. Think of these mounting pieces similar to the video cameras that you see out on the market. So we have uh, on that yoke, you have a one and a quarter inch threaded pipe that you'll be able to attach to the unit. So. Um, we've listed replacement accessories. These re replacement accessories are if you lose things, if you want more inventory, or if you um, uh, just want spare. Wireless manager. We, we list wireless manager here. Uh, that's just to give you an overall view of um, what the cost for the managing system is for very large deployments. If you're doing large deployments, definitely recommend wireless managers so that you can do full upgrades outdoors. Otherwise, you could just use the uh, graphical user interface that comes to the system. Make sure you buy that physical map license feature because that's the Google Maps version that we talked about. Okay, let's talk a little bit about competitors. So this is how we see the competitive landscape. Um, we like to uh, look across Cisco and we, we've watched Tropos and Firetide do some introductions. Cisco hasn't announced an end product yet but they've definitely certified the 1522. That they're using the Marvel chip in there. It's an end chip, but they haven't suggested they may, uh, they haven't announced an end chip. So what we notice is that they are, uh, remember Scott talked earlier about the nomenclature of three by three and three by two? Well, they're actually doing a one by three on the two four, which is one transmit chain and three receives. So they're definitely taking advantage of the MRC gains on the two four side. But you'll notice that they only have a one by one chain on the backhaul. So they basically took that box and FCC'd it for uh, a one by one in high throughput mode for N. So also, I want you to take a look at the total pricing. These are the MSRP pricing. Um, when people start putting out press releases about particular nodes, they usually just like to put the box price. 
They don't tell you about the antennas that you need and the power supply to plug in and the other things that you need to do for deployment. For instance, Tropos, uh, they've made an introduction. They have two nodes, the 6300, and I don't compare that to our AP7181. The 7320 is more comparable to the 7181, and they're doing a one by three again on the 2.4. So they're doing one transmit chain and three receipt chains on the 2.4. So they're going to take advantage of um, MRC gains on the 2.4, but notice again, on the back hole, they only did a one by one. Uh, again, they're doing dipole antennas. Remember Scott talked earlier about the self-shadowing and the interference problems outdoor? If you're not going to do a dual polarization diversity outdoors, the chances of getting to that second data stream are very, very slim. Let's uh, take a little bit of a look at Firetide. Okay, so I look at Firetide as a low uh, power radio, 20 dB, 3 by 3 on both uh, the 2.4 and the 5X, but it's only a point-to-point -point mode. They talk about meshing in their press releases, but it's actually in linear mode. Once you deploy these in linear mode, they're really just point to point, and there's no mesh capability and no access, client access. So for 68.95 MSRP, you can have a point to point solution, <laughs> and you can actually uh, take a look at the 7181. Take a look at our one watt radio. So our conducting power is one watt, and our EIRP is so the uh, max in North America, and we also can lower our power uh, to the other European countries. Very key in 802.11n, integrated panel antennas. If you don't do something with your RF system, you're not going to get to that second data stream, which is very key in 802.11n. All those claims to fame of data rates, you have to get to that second data stream, and you've got to be in a 40 megahertz channel to get there. So you can see that our price includes everything for a 48.99 MSRP. I'd like to turn it back over to Scott to wrap up. Great. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Ralph. And before we, we get into the question and answer, I just want to go back again. We, we feel we have the right solution at the right time. The three things we want you to remember is 300 megabits in the mesh uh, layer to provide highest capacity in, in an outdoor network, zero antennas for better coverage and no porcupine effect, and Motorola, the one company with one network, one complete portfolio. Before we get into the questions and answers, and I, I see uh, Matt is, you guys have been real great submitting questions. He's, he's sweating buckets over here trying to keep up with you. Uh, we, we probably won't be able to answer all of them uh, today. We'll try to get to you, back to you via email. But I would also encourage you to come to our free one-day training course on, on the 7181. It's, we're going to have it in Chicago. Dallas, Fort Worth, Boston, uh, out in San Francisco, and here in Lake Mary, near, near Orlando. So um, there's a registration uh, website that uh, probably, you, if you scroll down on the invitation to the, the webinar, uh, it was also accompanied there. Now this is uh, targeted for North America, uh, bars and uh, Motorola uh, people alike. Uh, if, you, if you can't find the um, registration site, uh, email Lynn Ventimiglia, and that's the email alb002 at motorola.com. Uh, some of the things that we'll be covering uh, is, you know, positioning, uh, standards and technology, hardware, software, providing a demonstration of the product, uh, network planning, uh, roadmap and ordering uh, process. So uh, we'll also be including a uh, session at the beginning on the point to point 800, which is being launched uh, at the same time. And we'll also cover broadband planner, uh, an overview of that and demonstration. So it's a full day. Uh, it's all free. We hope you can join us. So thank you very much. Uh, the other thing I would like you to encourage you to do to get more information is to go to motorola.com slash 802.11n. Uh, we have white papers up there uh, that define that go into deploying dot .11 in the out outdoor environment, uh, mesh connects. We've got spec sheets. We've got uh, a number of uh, marketing literature uh, up there and along with use cases. So a lot of things we talked about today are, are on that website and available for you to view. So. 
Uh, let's take a look at some of the questions that, that we, we've seen. And uh, Matt, what do you have for us? So uh, thank you very much, Scott. And uh, thanks to everybody who's been submitting questions. Uh, if I didn't get around to your question, uh, we will be gathering up the FAQ um, and presenting all the, the questions and answers uh, in, a, in a document after the call. And uh, we'll make sure people have an ability to get to that. Um, what I've done, I've selected uh, the top five or six um, of the larger questions that everyone was asking here. So uh, I'm going to throw this out to uh, our team here in Lent Mary. Um, first question is, when would a uh, VMM be available uh, for the AP7181 so that customers can do uh, mobility? And will we be qualifying uh, MIMO antennas uh, for that device? So uh, I think Bill Rubino is going to answer this question. So, so currently, as I had mentioned in my slides, uh, the 4300 VMM is compatible with the 7181. And that's going to give you um, a wireless broadband connectivity at mobile speeds. Uh, so this, this will be compatible in both a, uh, a 4300 network and a 7181 uh, network as well. Um, right now, it's too early to talk about having a .11 N based uh, VMM, but the, uh, the current version of the VMM is uh, going to give you uh, some decent capacity as well. And it will it is supported on 12 volts uh, DC. So, let me add to that a little bit. This is Scott. Um, yeah, it is on the roadmap. Um, I, we, we feel that the, the duo VMM uh, for like a single police car or uh, mobility, you'll gain uh, a lot more throughput being in an end network as we talked about having a BG client in, in the network. It will support mesh connects um, for, for fast handoff. So there's there's a, a lot of uh, value there and with higher bandwidth and true mobility uh, using that VMM. Uh, we, we anticipate having a VMM uh, sometime next year uh, that will be a dot .11 end based and we see that more targeted towards the mass transit uh, market where you need, they're looking to run uh, six or seven cameras on a single train and feeding that back uh, for the high capacity. So uh, that's, that's the story on the VMF. Great. Thank you, Bill, and uh, thanks to Scott there also. Um, a, uh, a set of questions came in uh, also on this topic. So will the AP7281 have an adaptive AP capability and be managed by our current uh, controllers such as the RF7000 uh, switch? If not, will RMF be able to push uh, configurations to AP71s uh, individually? So I think folks out there are looking for um, an aberration exactly how we intend to do our indoor-outdoor solutions. So what are the components that will make up that solution and how do we do seamless roaming as well? Right. So Bill went through quite a bit of that. Um, I don't know what time this, what, when this came in. Um, so we, we do anticipate a, a supporting adaptive AP, uh, probably in our second release. Uh, we'll be mapped closer to the 7131.4.x release, uh, which, which will support that also. So um, as Bill showed in the diagram, a lot of the interoperability will be, can be done through a wired connection, um, which in reality is what you will deploy anyways. It, it would be unlikely that you'll be deploying a mesh network outdoors that is only getting its uh, backhaul connectivity from a over-the-air mesh link on the 7131. If you'll be terminating that outdoor network with a wired connection, that will go back up through your layer 2-3 uh, switch. Um, so we anticipate that that will, that will cover 99% of the deployments. Uh, there's really only a couple of features that we would be looking to take advantage of, of on the AP switch. I mean on the uh, RFS switch, and uh, but we do have plans uh, on supporting that capability uh, in, in our second release. Great. Thank you, Scott. Um, our next question, uh, we had a lot of questions about air defense. So folks wanted to know, um, does the, uh, the AP7181 uh, work with uh, air defense uh, as a network sensor? No. <laughs> That's the short answer today. Uh, we do have some capabilities in the 7181 um, to be able to detect uh, rogue APs. Uh, the solution that we believe is actually more economical um, is to utilize the 7131 in an outdoor enclosure as a sensor node and deploy those as a 4 to 1 ratio. Uh, that will give you all the uh, 
air defense uh, features and capabilities at a, at a much lower cost than using a high-powered 7181 uh, just as a sensor node. Great. Well, thanks, Scott, again for the answer to that question. Um, our next question uh, is uh, about meshing. So uh, this is in two parts. Uh, can an AP7181 mesh with an AP7131? And if so, how does that actually work? How do you do that? So that's, I guess I'll take this one too. So um, <laughs> I'm on a roll. Um, yes, it can mesh. Uh, the AP7181 supports both mesh connects that we talked about and spanning tree. The AP7031 today supports. <laughs> Seventy-one thirty-one product management group. The uh, eight seventy-one thirty-one uh, sometime next year. But today, out the shoot, you can uh, mesh using spanning tree. Okay, so we're coming up to our last uh, couple of questions here on our Q and A session. Um, uh, another very popular question was, uh, when could we expect a four nine version uh, of the seventy-one eighty-one? And uh, in the period between now and when we release that product, how would we position uh, 4.9 with our customers? Um, that is slated for, we have a release too on the roadmap, which is slated for um, second, first half of 2010. And we have, a, it'll be a tri-radio solution, so you'll have additional SKUs added, which will be a tri-radio solution. And what was the other part of that? How do you position it? And how would you position in the short term uh, for customers who are looking for N uh, in the 4.9 space? Yeah, I would definitely position those for the public safety customers because of what we're going to do on those uh, nodes is we're going to have meshing capability across the radios now and also on the 4.9. So, um, well, the other piece is, uh, again, why, that's why we presented uh, the duo compatibility. Uh, today, duo supports 4.9. So um, a, a, a customer looking to start deploying a network now uh, can do that with 4.9 uh, on the Duo product. Uh, we'll, we'll have full compatibility. They can have 4.9 uh, VMMs for mobility. That's it's primarily used for public safety. Uh, then as the 7181 release 2 comes out, uh, you can deploy those in the high, the 7181s in high capacity, high throughway areas and uh, reposition the, the Duo nodes out to the edge of the network uh, so that you have uh, connectivity and where there's less capacity needed. Okay, so I'm going to move on to our, our final question uh, because uh, time is rapidly running out on us here. Um, what are our plans to obtain FIPS 140-2 compliance for the AP7181? Again, that was a very popular question here on the Q&A. Okay, we're slating that for release two. We have um, that's slated on the roadmap. As, as everybody knows, we're getting uh, 7131 compliance on the FIPS. We're going to be able to take that 4.x baseline, port it over to the 7181. We'll probably release the hardware first, just because the FIPS compliance and certification takes a long, takes like three to six months and paperwork to do. So we'll be FIPS compliant in release two. We will GA the hardware and then follow with the third. Okay, so that's uh, the end of our Q&A session here. Um, as I said before, we will make sure that the full Q&A uh, is documented and, uh, and everyone will be able to see that online. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Ralph. Um, yeah, it, it, it seemed like a lot of those questions were released too, but it, you actually hit the top three or four features that are in release too, so uh, good questions. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending, and I hope it was worth your while. <laughs>